Over the past decade, a dozen teams have been competing for the last great aviation prize, to be the first to fly around the world non-stop in a balloon. Isolated in their tiny capsules, all the competitors have stared disaster in the face. Balloons cost a lot of money, so it's a sport for millionaires. Yet this year, among the contestants are a retired RAF instructor flying with a Swiss doctor. And remarkably, on March the 20th, 1999, it was Bertrand Picard and Brian Jones and the Breitling Orbiter Balloon who beat everyone else to scoop the prize. It's fabulous. This film shows their extraordinary, record-breaking 20-day flight exclusively from inside their capsule. Just 13 weeks earlier, billionaire Richard Branson had taken off from the Moroccan desert for his third attempt to circle the globe. Flying again with balloon manufacturer Per Lindstrand, he joined up with millionaire American Steve Fossett. Backed by a huge support team, it seemed that this time they must succeed. Three, two, one, go. Everything was gelling right and it was a very warm feeling. At this stage, the Breitling team is being left far behind. Even Bertrand Picard's original co-pilot has resigned. So he's asked the man who'd built his capsule to come with him, a retired RAF instructor from a small village in Wiltshire called Brian Jones. And looking just, uh, just look up here. It's an extraordinary feeling to be thinking about how best to uh, keep the pilots safe, to, to look at the different systems, discussing different systems, and I'm really pleased with myself now that I did the best I could because uh, here I am, I'm going to be in it. So. With Branson already halfway around the world, would they ever even take off? But eight days into his flight, Branson faltered. Okay, Good luck, everybody. On Christmas Day, after flying 13,000 miles, bad weather forced him down in the middle of the Pacific. As they hit the water, the explosive bolts that should separate the balloon from the capsule failed. They were being dragged along through four-meter waves at speeds of up to 20 miles an hour. 18 knots. They decided to jump for it before they were dragged under and drowned. We gripped each other and jumped together into the water. Steve and I, we looked each other in the eye and felt, you know, it was a good feeling to be alive. His multi-million pound balloon destroyed, Branson declared he'd try again. But he couldn't be ready till the summer. For Picard and Jones, this is a reprieve. But they'll have to hurry. Quicker, and we take a smaller balloon with less fuel. So the strategies are completely different, different and it will be very interesting at the end to see who was right. To get round the Earth, a balloon needs to find and enter the high-speed jet stream winds that circle the globe. But by springtime, they're beginning to fragment and fade. This is the last Breitling attempt. They've made that perfectly clear, so we have to go for it. Jones and Picard know that the sponsor's Breitling will not pay for another balloon. This could be their last chance. When we came, Brian and I, this morning with a car and saw this balloon and realized it was for us and it's the work of so many people just to allow us to make this dream, to make this ultimate flight that every balloon pilot would like to make. It's very emotional. It's really a strong feeling. 
The forecasters predict that tomorrow the winds at dawn will be light and the weather good. It's now or never. For Picard, there is more than personal pride involved. He's carrying the weight of an extraordinary family history. As a pioneer, he's trying to live up to both his father and grandfather. In 1931, his grandfather had been the first man to fly into the stratosphere 50,000 feet above the Earth. His father, Jacques Picard, dived deeper than any man in history. In my family, I had always the, the example of people making scientific adventures. My grandfather and my father, but also all the people that I met when I was a child. All these people gave me the taste of adventure, of science, of exploration. And I was deeply impressed by that when I was a child. Better than most, his father Jacques understands the challenge that lies ahead for his son. I know that it's because of all he gave me for the taste of exploration that I was at that place at that moment to take off. And I just told him thank you for that. I was wondering how I was going to say cheerio to Joe. I just knew that I would break down and blub if there was almost a crack in her face. But she just looked supremely confident. And she just said to me, go do it. It's one hour before takeoff. Suddenly the wind freshens. The balloon tugs at its restraints, as if eager to be on its way. We had a wind of about four or five knots, quite gusty. The balloon was lifting up, was hitting the ground again. We had 32 three and a half meter propane tanks hanging off the side of this thing. To go or not to go. Picard's two earlier flights had failed spectacularly. In 1997, he crash-landed after just six hours. In 1998, in a record-breaking nine days, he flew 10,000 miles before being forced to abandon the flight in Burma. In Switzerland, the weather is now deteriorating rapidly. Underneath, we'd put huge polystyrene blocks just to keep the tanks off the ground. And that was making this horrible noise. It was not the gondola cracking, it was just the polystyrene blocks absorbing the shocks. It's getting more dangerous by the minute. Eventually, it got so out of control that the only thing was to actually cut us free. The worst thing you can do is to go up too fast because you start spilling your helium and it just creates all sorts of problems. And there's Brightling Orbiter 3 going up like a veritable rocket. Nonetheless, the takeoff is successful. It's Bertrand Picard's 41st birthday. Here's the very small thing. Yeah, that's nice, Brian. Because of Picard's choice of launch site, they've given themselves extra problems. To join the easterly jet streams, they must first find winds to take them south, over the Alps and on towards Africa. It's completely the wrong direction. 
spectacular views of the Alps. Pretty fantastic. The Eiger, uh, the Matterhorn, I remember seeing quite clearly. The Jungfrau and Mont Blanc. Just fabulous. Even worse, another competitor is in the air and 12 days ahead of them. British balloonists Andy Elson and Colin Prescott had taken off from southern Spain just across the Straits of Gibraltar from Africa. They had a thousand mile head start. They're already over Burma. In the Breitling Flight Control Center at Geneva Airport, their support team is monitoring the weather while flight director Alan Noble assesses the progress of the opposition. I think there are, there are probably only two ways that Breitling can, can beat cable and wireless. Uh, way one, of course, is if they run out of fuel. We win one degree if we stay on the same level. The second way is that the weathermen, Luke Trullemans and Pierre Eckert, can find faster winds than their rivals. It's incredible. Eh? That's very good. This is our play with the, with the, with the mitts. Yeah. It would be really exciting if we could catch them up other states, wouldn't it? Now over Africa, Jones and Picard are still crawling along, looking for the wind. We're beginning our fourth day, and below, with sunrise, we just have red sand. Dangling off the side of the capsule are 16 pairs of fuel tanks. So that's ready. When we go around the world, we need to throw some ballast and we need to have the balloon lighter as possible. So, of course, the, the empty tanks were dropped. When there were clouds below the balloon, we never dropped anything. Bye-bye. They estimate each pair of tanks will last only a day, limiting the flight to 16 days. The weathermen say that's barely enough time to get round the world. When the first pair of tanks, I think, lasted something like 31 hours, we were absolutely amazed. We couldn't believe our luck because when we started to plot this out, it suddenly looked as if we had 24 days duration. Well done. Suddenly, we had the impression that we would have enough fuel and we really started to enjoy the flight. This is Bertrand uh, in window cleaning mode with his patented uh, chamois leather, trying to clean some bird doo-doo from the outside of the porthole. Not only trying to clean, cleaning. <laughs> At the Geneva Control Center, Noble is grappling with more serious problems. The balloon is going too slowly, mm -hmm. and there are other complications. Okay, because they have a, a, a small war going on. Mm. OK? It's just below Sudan, so they are going that way. I don't know exactly where they're going. Though. Ahead lies Libya, another political hurdle. Three months earlier, Richard Branson's flight had stalled there, almost before it had begun. We've got uh, a message just handed to me from Libya saying that our permit number has been cancelled for the balloon. The Branson balloon had been heading for one of Libya's most sensitive military bases. Kerr and Richard were even considering the possibility of running through Libya without permission, which was a horrifying thought to me. Co-pilot Steve Fawcett had been refused entry to Libya on two previous solo attempts. Yeah, and then just thought, hey. Last year, I got my permission on a last-minute basis through International Boy Scout connections because uh, Crawford was a Queen Scout under the English uh, scouting system. In the capsule, Branson had produced his personal contacts book and telephoned the King of Morocco's political advisor. It had worked. In the Breitling balloon, Jones and Picard sail through Libya without incident. They find the jet stream, but high up in the freezing wind, tons of ice are forming on their balloon. In the beginning, we thought it would make no problem, but then after a few minutes, we saw that all this water who was melting from the envelope was freezing on the gondola and freezing on the tanks. So we had icicles about two meters long 
uh, along the cables and the, um, and the fuel tanks. When we were above the desert, we were about 10,000 feet high. We opened the hatch, we went out to the fire axis, and we started to break the icicles like I do with my children when, when we're in the chalet in the mountain. It was really fun. And all this ice was falling over the desert where probably it has not been snowing or raining since 2,000 years. To melt the ice, they go lower and slower. Breitling is slipping further behind cable and wireless. Ahead lie the Himalayas, the highest barrier they face, and perhaps the most dangerous politically, because of what happened to Richard Branson there three months before. Nobody's ever flown across the Himalayas before, and um, it is just unbelievable. Branson's course had taken him into direct conflict with the Chinese government. They'd been heading towards that part of China, north of the 26th parallel, where no one had permission to fly. The Chinese reaction had been swift and clear. Richard, the situation is this. Beijing contacted us and said, do not enter. Well, what the fuck are we going to do? We can't, man. Flight director Mike Kendrick had a couple of hours to avert a major row with the help of Branson's impeccable contacts book. Is that Edward Heath? Oh, Ted Heath, thank you very much for talking to us. I've got Richard on, um, on a capsule phone. Um, somewhere over the Himalayas. All right, would you get, get me Ted Downing's number quickly? Yes. Well, look, I, I, look, I need more than one or two people working on this. We've got six. Pe Hong we've got six people. Right, who's, getting the, who's getting the Premier of Hong Kong's number? Telephone number. Call me. I've got the Premier of. Hong I've got that number, Richard. One second. Mike, yes. one nine two. Call one nine two. Wait, wait, don't give me this crap. I want the numbers now. All you don't do is find... By the early hours of December the 22nd, the winds had driven them into China without permission. The longer they talked, the further they flew. And it worked, with a little help from another friend. Well, Tony Blair was good enough to actually write a personal letter to the Premier of China, and I think that that helped enormously in actually getting our permission to go through. China's reaction was to ban all other teams. At the time, Bertrand Picard felt Branson had ruined his chances. I can understand the, the wish of Branson to, of course, to, to go through, because it was maybe his only chance to succeed in the flight. So I, I, I'm not in a position where I want to blame him, but the consequences for us are really embarrassing. Picard had been to Beijing the previous year to negotiate permission in person. Impressed by his efforts, the Chinese now revised their ban. Picard's Swiss balloon could fly through, but all British registered balloons would stay banned. But the permission has strings attached. Picard and Jones must stay south of the 26th parallel while they're in Chinese airspace. They must set up their track into China 2,000 miles before they get there, with only the wind to steer them. Arriving on the Red Sea on the morning of the 6th of March. Coming from Sudan, heading for Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Flying flight level 215. And if we fly a little lower, will get at the right time over Saudi Arabia and Oman to go south of China. And we have to gain as much possible degrees to the south. So I'm going to open the gas valve and let a little bit of our helium go out. Flying a balloon sounds simple. Discharging helium makes the balloon sink. Using the burners makes it go up again. By changing height, the pilots try to find the wind direction they want. That's the theory and the limit of the balloonists' control. But as they line up their charge at China, they realize they'll cross a prohibited area in the Yemen. One map that they saw that they shoot down all the airplanes who are coming there, and they shoot without warning. So what's he saying? So he said that they're working on two different 
ways to work out this danger prohibited area in Yemen. The weather people are trying to make us avoid it, and the air traffic controllers of, air, of the Swiss control are trying to get a permission to go through. The team in Geneva can't get permission, so the balloon has to change course. They struggle to get back on a more southerly track towards China. It costs them time and fuel. But they're catching the British cable and wireless balloon. Their rivals have no permission to fly over China, so they're having to go all the way round. Breitling are only four days behind. Their straight line through China will close that gap even further. Is there. Okay. Um, we looked for these um, danger areas, restricted areas. But they presently over India, they'll be out of India uh, and to China tonight. Uh, we're allowed to fly in China up to 26 north and the, uh, the meteorologists are saying they'll take them across China just below 26 north and then out across the Pacific. Every step they take now is crucial, as they line the balloon up to cross the most difficult country en route. And, uh, by the way, I wish you good luck for your attempt to circumnavigate the world. I must get Hotel Romeo Alpha. Much appreciated, sir. Remain this frequency. We'll go. They befriend the local air traffic controllers. We had to fly low, we had to fly slow, and we hope to get in the jet stream for the Pacific. And I really hope that we will speed up a little bit because uh, for the fuel consumption, it's not very reassuring to fly so low. Low and slow, perhaps. But after eight days and 9,000 miles in the air, Jones and Picard are about to enter Chinese airspace. They have to stay south of the 26th parallel, as difficult as walking a tightrope a 1,000 miles long. Well, here we are at the Chinese uh, border, uh, just south of the 26 degrees. And uh, a little bit turbulent now as we're heading into the mountains. And we shall see what happens. The first thing that the Chinese controller at Kunming said when we called them up and established radio contact was that you are not allowed to go across 26 North. So that was stated in no uncertain terms. And then there was cloud beneath us for the, the whole of the rest of our journey across China. We have to play just at the limit of the clouds in order to have the right speed and the right track according to Luc and Pierre. That's why over China, we're just really very low over the clouds. Flight level 165. This is what we can actually see of China. Overhead, Guilin, on the 10th of March. Everything is perfect to the air traffic controllers of China. They are very nice. They were aware of the coming of the balloon. And we have very good communication. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Hotel Bravo, Bravo Romeo Alpha. The line across China was a straight line at 25.5 degrees. No, it was incredible. I think there was a little bit of miracle also to be able to fly so many thousand kilometers in a straight line. It's the only part of the flight where we were absolutely in a straight line. As they near the Chinese coast, the skies begin to clear. They leave China at exactly the same latitude they entered, just 30 miles south of the no-fly zone. We have a wonderful panettone, I will zoom on it, it will put everybody in appetite. So this is breakfast on the 11th of March at eight o'clock in the morning, Zulu time. If you make already your panettone for tomorrow, it will be maybe a little dry, because today it's the 10th. <laughs> <laughs> I have to check with your beard. 
It's a beard of 10 days, uh, not 11 days. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Cable and wireless had succeeded in flying round China. But then Picard and Jones received bittersweet news. Just got now an absolutely incredible message that I read. Hello again, Bertrand. I have just had a telephone call from Alan, has been contacted by the cable and wireless control room to say that the balloon is landing 70 miles off the coast of Japan. The reason given is that the balloon is high stopped. They plan to land in the sea and search and rescue are with them now. Cable and wireless pilot Andy Elson had been with Picard on an earlier Breitling flight, but he switched teams at the wrong time. The race for the record can now go to only one team, Picard and Jones. It was a total shock and surprise uh, when I heard that they were down, but uh, it was a, a lot of relief. Well, it's incredible. It, it, I, I have emotions for them because I know how bad it must be. There's no pleasure for me to know that they have this kind of problems. It even gives a little, little fear that it could also happen to us to have the balloon so high step that we have to land, it would really be sad. As they come to the edge of the Pacific, the Breitling team faces a crucial choice. When we came out of China and crossed over to Taiwan, the Met people were looking to put us up to Japan, just the way Andy had gone, pick up the, the fast jet streams over the north of the Pacific, that's the polar jet, into uh, America. The Northern Pacific jet stream, which all their rivals had planned to take, might push them into thunderstorms over Japan. There is a second route across the widest part of the Southern Pacific. Nobody has ever succeeded in taking it. The balloon is at a crossroads, and Alan Noble must advise the pilots which way to turn. You, must, you, you need to take a decision now, because from this point, I go to the south. If we go north, we'll go, have to go slow over the Atlantic, and we might run into that bad weather over the Pacific. Whereas here, we can go high. Well, I think we should go for this jet, and we land in Timbuktu. You ask, we do it. <laughs> It's an enormous gamble. The southern route is not only longer, slower, and more dangerous, but the decision is totally based on a prediction that the strong winds they need will appear in three days' time. The balloonists agree to set out across the Pacific in the hope the jet stream will be there. If the weathermen are wrong, there's no way home. They must go higher. They drop empty tanks, sacks of ballast, and all their fresh food. OK. Yes, OK, go ahead. From now on, the diet will be water, dried pasta, and bread. OK, now we're going up at uh, 300 feet a minute. So we obviously did something. There are other reasons that make it vital to climb. Thunder clouds lie dead ahead. The weathermen say the balloon must go even higher, and with good reason. Richard Branson's teammate, Steve Fawcett, had previously attempted a southern Pacific route, but was sucked into thunder clouds 500 out into the ocean. In the vastness of the Pacific, it was a miracle he survived. Me. The first indication of problem came when the uh, balloon entered a descent of uh, 500 feet a minute. And then it reversed and it went to about 1,000 foot a minute climb. And then it reversed again. And at that point, I believe the uh, balloon ruptured because I went into a very rapid descent. The uh, balloon was really being thrown from side to side. I was burning heavily. And then there was just waves of hail. And the burners on full blast. And so it was uh, burning parts of the balloon. So it was really a vision of hell. At that point, I said softly out loud, I'm going to die. Some people have asked me whether you know, your life flashes in front of you uh, in this kind of a situation. Well, no, because uh, you see, I had about eight minutes because of the enormous distance that I was falling, even though I was falling very fast. Yeah, I laid down on my back to uh, take the impact. 
just watch the altimeter as it zinged through, then I think I must have been knocked out. If you bailed out without even being able to get a survival suit, of course, then, you know, we're in a long shot scenario. Fawcett had managed to scramble into a life raft. After a 10-hour search, he was picked up by a passing ship. I would not have made that flight if I had known the risk was that high. I just didn't believe I was exposed to that much danger. So Fawcett had failed, yet he had flown 13,000 miles before ditching. It was the furthest any balloon had gone so far. Now, six months later, Breitling are facing similar dangers. We would look out of the, the portholes and we'd see these cumulonimbus clouds on the horizon all around us and thinking, if we fly into one of those tonight, it could just be the end. No warning, you can't see out at night. You fly into one of these things and the balloon is going to be destroyed. We're over the Pacific now for more than two days. All this is blue water. Turn your back. There's still no sign of the jet stream they were promised, and they're burning too much fuel. We're a little afraid, a little afraid, Brian and I. We talked about it, have the butterflies in the stomach. The people in the control center are very nice, and they understand, and they make reassuring faxes. But then the reassuring faxes stop. The balloon loses contact with the control center. Uh, our satellite communications with them have been temperamental all day. In, uh, Alan Noble tries to communicate with the balloon via Pacific Region Air Traffic Control in Oakland, California. Um, if, we, if we don't have any comms with Oakland in, say, the next 45 minutes, I shall be start to get extremely worried. I mean, I, I think if, uh, if you've got any overflying aircraft and they gave a call on 1215, the balloon is probably monitoring that frequency on the VHF. Now, we don't have anybody anywhere near him. Nowhere near him? No, nobody anywhere near him. Oh, OK. So, OK, that's, so... That's one of the problems. OK, well, okay. well, we'll talk again in an hour if nothing's happened. All right, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Noble's only proof that the Breitling orbiter is in the air comes from automatic beacons on board the balloon. It's an agonizing time. He doesn't even know if the pilots are alive. Out of touch, Jones and Picard are beginning to lose confidence. We did not know where to go. We did not know at which altitude was the good wind. We were consuming far too much propane, we saw that the flight had the risk to fail that moment. Flying very high to avoid dangerous thunderclouds, the balloon is icing up again. We were looking out through the top hatch to see huge icicles hanging off all around, and we were thinking, well, you know, just how much weight is on this balloon? What's it going to do to us? Are we going to be able to stay airborne for a while? Who are we going to scream for, for rescue? We're 6,000 miles from the nearest land base. We had to accept that there was a, a lot of weight on top of the gondola. And so the probability was that if we went into the water, the thing would flip over upside down, and that we may have to take to our uh, single-man life rafts. If they're forced to ditch, it could take a week to get to them. Their chances of survival will, at best, be slim. They have only each other and our onboard cameras to talk to. It's uh, horribly slow. We're only doing 21 knots at the moment. We're still uh, nearly 2,000 miles away from, from Hawaii. So we're right out in the middle of, uh, of no nowhere and not going very fast. Early on March the 14th, the balloon regains contact with the control center. Just to let you know, we've now received a written message from the crew 
For the first time in two days, Picard can talk to his wife, Michelle. He was a little bit down. It was difficult. So much water, water. He was also not flying very fastly. And uh, yes, he was a little bit uh, depressed. It's not easy for them. After five painfully slow days over the ocean, they find the jet stream. It's uh, awfully cold still, and um, all the people at uh, all our team at the control center are very upbeat about uh, the speed and uh, how quickly we might be home. Um, I have to say that we've still got 2,000 miles to go before we reach the coast of Mexico, so I think it may be a little bit early to be uh, counting our chickens. But um, who knows? Everything is going well, oh, except that I've broken a nail. But, um, and I could do with washing my hair, of course. But uh, that, uh, it's going to have to wait for a few more days yet. 6,000 miles after they last saw land, they have a record to celebrate. Dr. Picard, could you tell me how it feels to be the official world record holder for the balloon distance record? The distance record is a consolation prize. So I hope we have the real prize. <laughs> Very well put. And um, w w w was it good for just waking up? Was it a good answer? Oh, it was excellent. It was excellent, yes. This is Brian Jones at Mid Pacific for um, whatever. <laughs> Two days later, they sight land. They've crossed the world's biggest ocean in six and a half days and made it to Mexico. You see there the. Um, girl in the green, green bikini. She's quite nice. Yeah? Very nice. And, but she has a big husband with her. But their high spirits are premature. At the height they're now flying, their lives depend totally on the air supply system inside the capsule. Something is going terribly wrong with it. Both Bertrand and I were suffering with uh, Lack of breath, really. We were panting. I'd been in bed for, I don't know, five, six hours. Uh, couldn't get my breath. And I woke up and I heard Bertrand uh, panting the same. They were slowly suffocating. Another hour and they could have lost consciousness. They were suffering from carbon dioxide poisoning. We um, boosted the oxygen in the gondola to not dangerous levels, but, but high, and uh, very quickly we recovered. But it isn't their only problem. They're going the wrong way, drifting too far south. We'd been spat out of the jet stream to the south. We had a track of about 110 degrees, and we needed 85 degrees. So we needed to find 15 degrees to the left. We needed to climb high. And uh, Bertrand did that. He pushed the balloon right to our absolute maximum altitude we could go. And it was in the last 300 feet that he found this, this extraordinary track of, of 085. It was precisely that. Without this miraculous change in direction, they would have ended up in the sea off South America. We were incredibly lucky at that point, and I know we'd said afterwards that uh, nobody gets that lucky for that long. Breitling Orbiter 3. Bertrand, it's Alan. Yes, hello Alan. We're here, Brian and I, together. Okay, well, as we, uh, as we agreed, this is a time when we have to talk about uh, whether we're going to go on across the Atlantic or not. Yes, absolutely. Uh, can you just confirm your fuel tank state to me, please? Yes, we have two complete pairs. Okay, and how are you and Brian feeling? There was some concern yesterday when uh, you were a bit breathless. Are you, are you okay now? Yes, our only concern is that somebody in the control center uh, would say you have not, not enough fuel, you have to stop. That's our only concern. We're really like to, to head for Africa now. Uh, we're going anyway. <laughs> Bertrand and I had both looked at each other and we had this tacit agreement, I know, almost without saying anything, that we were going to go for it. Even if Alan had said, no, we think that you should land, we probably would have said, on your bike, we're off. It's a brave decision, 
With 80% of their fuel gone, there's a quarter of the world still to fly. And the new map is, is still, quite OK. It's blue. No, not completely. Look, we're already, we're already here, north of yeah. Puerto Rico. Yeah. Of course, this is blue. But when you turn it, without any other fold, <laughs> you have Africa on the other oh, side. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. On the, the Atlantic Ocean is, a, is an incredibly daunting uh, thought uh, to cross by balloon. Engineering at its best. We had a, an awful lot of technical problems, mainly due to ice. We'd lost virtually all of our safety systems. When the autopilot wanted to inject some fuel into the burners, uh, if it didn't catch immediately, you'd get this huge whoomph, and the balloon would shake and shudder, and uh, it was a fairly frightening uh, experience. At the balloon's present speed, it'll take four days to reach land and victory. They only have fuel for two. We can succeed if we have great luck. We can succeed if the winds are with us. I think we can succeed only if we are guided by God. Otherwise, there are so many things that can happen in the wrong way. And then fate plays its hand. I was doing my utmost to try to work out all of the sort of the what-if scenarios about the fuel and really did we have enough fuel to get this to the finish line did could we get to the coast i watched the speed in the course of five maybe ten minutes and the speed went 40 50 60 70 80 90 100 knots just what we want to get us around the world that was when i just sort of pushed the papers away in front of me and thought that's it we're home They are now traveling at over 100 miles an hour. Africa is just one day away. And because they went so far west at the start, they only have a few hundred miles of land to cross to win the race. We're now approaching the coast of Mauritania on the 20th of March, six o'clock in the morning. And in five to seven hours, we'll cross the finish line. It's incredible. I cannot believe it's true. The sun is rising over the desert of the Western Sahara. In three to four hours, Brian and I will have crossed the finish line of the first round the world flight non-stop in a balloon. We've done it. Is it? Is that it? The actual crossing of the finish line was, was almost uh, certainly not a disappointment. It was a great moment. <laughs> Fabulous. Fantastic. Oh, it? <laughs> Come on. We went across this line and we, yes, hugged each other and we knocked that stupid football, then looked at each other and thought, well, now what do we do? <laughs> so when we succeeded, we were completely out of ideas and out of emotions. We were just there, a little bit embarrassed. Why, why us? But they're not out of danger. Beneath them are hundreds of miles of mountains, minefields, and bandit country. They have to fly on, with the fuel gauges flickering on zero. Without fuel, on this kind of balloon, you cannot fly it, even, even during the day. If they run out of fuel now, there's no way they can land the balloon safely. By March the 21st, they're over Egypt. They have no idea exactly how much fuel they have left. They simply have to get down. Landing is one of the most dangerous parts of the flight. Open. 
the other gas van. I had no idea we were going to touch the ground. It was an awful thing to say. The first time we touched the ground, it was not on purpose. <laughs> we banked 300 feet after this first landing. Can you check the time? What time is it? Six o'clock. Fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> we could look all around the horizon through 360 degrees, and there was nothing but absolutely flat, barren land. And it seemed quite appropriate that we were there on our own. That's how much fuel we've got left. After three weeks. After three weeks. And 40,000 kilometers. What a wonderful piece of planning on our behalf. Oh. Bertrand put it beautifully in, in Geneva at the press conference when he said, we took off as friends and landed as brothers. They wait seven hours to be rescued. years after man first took to the skies, Bertrand Picard and Brian Jones have made the ultimate balloon flight around the world in 20 days. This match that's running wild Butterflies and zebras, blue beams and fairy tales All she ever thinks about is riding with the wind 